Hello. Hello, this is uh, Dr. Kozhanov at the Georgia State University, and uh, this is online lecture four. Uh, and um, as you can see, I decided to include another topic. This is uh, a very important topic that I don't want to miss in this lecture series. And uh, the importance of this uh, is uh, fairy magnetism is mainly, um, well, uh, there, are, there are many applications of these materials and they are very important for applications. So, therefore, uh, uh, this lecture is dedicated to ferromagnetism. So, before I begin, I would like to encourage you to read uh, Nicholas Spalding's textbook. This is one of the, the first textbooks that I recommended uh, uh, for the course. And uh, chapter 9 of this textbook is dedicated to ferromagnetism. Fairy magnetism. Okay, so to start, I would like to recap. So we discussed many different magnetic materials, and uh, there were diamagnets, paramagnets, and uh, we looked at the Weiss theory and applied it to ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. So, um, in some sense, the ferromagnets uh, and uh, antiferromagnets, there is a similarity. So, ferromagnets um, and uh, antiferromagnets. Uh, as you remember, um, both materials, if you heat them up, they become paramagnetic. And uh, there is a certain temperature, and that's a Curie temperature for ferromagnet and Neal temperature for antiferromagnet. They become ordered. And the ordering of these two materials is uh, ferromagnetic. Basically, magnetic moments are pointed in the same direction. And antiferromagnetic, where we have two sublattices uh, in which uh, alternating uh, magnetic moments are alternating, pointing up, down, up, down. Of course, we point, uh, we have them pointing up or up, down, up, down. Uh, this is an arbitrary direction. It can be pointed in any direction within the ferromagnet, but with respect to each other, they will be directing in the same direction in ferromagnets and the opposite directions in the antiferromagnet. Now, uh, in uh, as you remember, in antiferromagnet, we were uh, treating those. We were basically saying that there is a sublattice A, and uh, there also is a sublattice B. I will color indicate them by color, and uh, there were magnetizations, and uh, this is uh, B, B, and uh, this is A, A. So they're alternating. And uh, to describe those, we use uh, magnetizations of each of those. So basically, we were saying that magnetization, this is magnitude of magnetization A is equal to the magnitude of magnetization B. So basically, if you take, for example, one of the oxides, manganese oxides, with a super exchange, or for example, chromium, we would have exact the same elements, chromium. It just would be pointing up, down, up, down. Now uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a set of materials which are called anti-ferri uh, magnetic. So again, ferri magnetic, ferromagnets. It's important. This I is important because it's uh, not ferromagnet. You see, ferromagnet. Uh, this I changes. Uh, ferromagnet is this alkalinear. Ferrimagnet, ferrimagnets is the class of material I would like to talk about right now. So, ferromagnets is a material, if you look at the magnetic arrangement, first of all, there are two different types of uh, atoms. That, uh, the, that magnetic atoms that build this material. So in general, no, it can be not two, but uh, in most cases two. So there is one atom with magnetic moment pointing up, uh, and it forms a lattice. And the other atom forms the uh, sublattice with magnetic moment pointing down. But as you may notice here when I draw this, and this is repeated, 
and it can be repeated in both directions. As you noticed, this magnetic moment has big arrow here and, and uh, it indicates large magnetic moment. And this one is smaller, which means that one of them is bigger, other one is smaller. And when this material is ordered, uh, then basically one of the sub lattices uh, has larger magnetic moment and this material exhibits properties very similar to ferromagnets. So if you look at the two-dimensional, this is a picture just to please the eye. This is an image from Wikipedia, now again, non-credible source. But uh, you can see the uh, alignment of those. So there is a ferromagnetic alignment of lattice A. And, oh, oops, and uh, anti-ferromagnetic alignment between lattice A and B, A and B, they alternate. Uh, now, we can look at uh, the magnetic properties of this. So when we measure those, and uh, we can measure the magnetic properties uh, by measuring either hysteresis loop or um, a hysteresis loop or measuring susceptibility. Now, if we uh, let's say if you measure a hysteresis loop H and M, if I would draw something like this, or maybe something like that, if you would look at this, you wouldn't tell if it's a ferry magnet or ferromagnet, and uh, in case of huge, well, anti ferromagnet might have a different behavior. It has zero magnetic moment, but there is a way how it can be straightened out. So that's different. But uh, there is no way to d distinguish those two. Now, other way to measure is to do temperature dependent measurements. So if we plot uh, uh, temperature and, for example, magnetization. As you remember, uh, let me make the pen smaller. Uh, as you remember, for the ferromagnets, it stays ordered. And as we approach the Curie temperature, the magnetization drops. And uh, it drops to, uh, to uh, zero, basically. And this is a Curie temperature. That's a temperature where above it, we have a paramagnetic state. And below, we have a ferromagnet. Let me write it right here. So this is ferromagnet. Fm everywhere, wherever I use it in the course, stands for ferromagnet. Um, now, if you look at the ferry magnet, then you would see that uh, similar to ferromagnet, it has zero magnetization here uh, in at zero magnetic field. And uh, as we come to the Curie temperature, it would have much slower growing magnetization and it grows to a uh, much smaller value it is much smaller value because you can see here uh sub lattice a let's say if this is a this is b a b in the chain sub lattice a has larger magnetic moments sub lattice b has smaller magnetic moments and if you add those two let me see uh, you take sub lattice A. Well, let me do a better job drawing a straight line. Um, so if uh, if we do well, not quite a better job, but hey. Um, so this would be M A, and I'll use a different color, and that would be M B. So the resulting magnetization, I will just highlight it here. This would be the resulting magnetization. So the magnetization would be pointing up, but it would be fairly small. It would be small because uh, the sub lattice A is partially compensated by sub lattice B. So the magnetization level is fairly, it's not, it's not it does not possess very strong magnetic uh, magnetization overall, but it might. It depends on the material. And uh, the curve goes slightly different uh, way. Now, the other characteristic for a uh, ferromagnet, and we are talking about macroscopic things that you can measure. Okay, let me use the shapes that are available for me. So, oops, no, the other way. Uh, I would use the same shape. 
no the other way okay i'll draw <laughs> uh so we draw again the temperature dependence so this is temperature of reverse susceptibility again you may notice uh if, as you remember there is this uh, uh curry temperature tc Curie temperature. Above Curie temperature, we have a um, we have per, uh, paramagnetic state, and uh, as you remember, is just a straight line. Uh, it's a straight line, uh, and uh, inverse susceptibility is proportional to temperature. It goes to zero at Curie temperature. This is ferromagnet. Now. Uh, and uh, below, we, we, we might have different different things happening below. Uh, we will look at this area. This is a paramagnetic uh, state. Uh, and this is a ferromagnet. Don't get confused with these two. This is a state above Curie temperature, but this is the material. Now, if you look at a uh, fer ferry magnet, then you will see that there is a small deviation from, uh, from, from that curve. So it would start to grow a bit higher, but then at fairly high temperatures, it would, it would follow the, uh, it would follow the, uh, um, basically Curie base law. Now, this is macroscopic things. This is something that you can measure. Um, uh, let's uh, look into a theory. So I would say that this is the end of this part. Now, what we will look into is, uh, you see, when we talked about um, anti-ferromagnetism, then uh, we use these approaches of two sublattices and basically this is a uh, base theory but this 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 time we will apply to ferry magnetism okay so uh the interesting part uh, is um, uh, uh the 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 main difference there are several things uh, first of all, again, as previous time, I won't draw it's the same picture as I already drawn. Let me scroll up to show you it. So this, uh, we have uh, sublattice A and sublattice B. A points up, B points down, but in contrast to antiferromagnetism, we will have these A and B magnetizations that are not equal. Okay, so... Um, so what we do is we have sub lattice sub lattices m a which is not the same as m b so again as you remember in antiferromagnetic theory we said that there is only nearest neighbor interaction sub lattice a interacts with sub lattice b only here it's quite different because uh, first of all they have different magnetic moments and uh, we have to um, take the we, we, and the, the, the two sub lattices are anti-parallel so we have to take other interactions in other interactions into account first of all similar to this we will in, you know, take into account a to b sub lattice interaction this is a nearest neighbor interaction and uh, exchange interaction forces it to be aligned anti-parallelly, so it's anti-ferromagnetic alignment. But besides this, since we have different magnetic moments and they also interact, we have to consider interaction of magnetic moments of sublattice A and also magnetic moments of sublattice B. So all these three has to be considered. Now, if you consider these interactions, uh, let me introduce a couple of things, and it is similar to what we had before. So um, uh, we will use M A M A. That would be a magnetic moment. I would say average magnetic moment of sublattice A 
uh, actual not sublattice but of a iron iron of sublattice a and similarly mb small m is average value of magnetic moment uh, of ions ions well sorry i have an opportunity i have the ways to rewrite things so ions of sublattice b so this is better way to say it okay so now we will also introduce fractions so let's say alpha would be a fraction of um, uh, of a ions of all ions and beta would be a fraction of ions b ions ions of sublattice b so obviously uh, the lattice is formed of ion, uh, magnetic ions a and b therefore our beta and alpha should be equal to one hundred percent or we can say that beta is equal to one minus alpha uh, okay now also we will use the same value as we used before n would be number of magnetic uh, ions per unit volume basically the concentration of magnetic ions how many of them per unit volume then uh, we can write magnetization of sublattice a and sublattice b in terms of the uh, these uh, this um, like quantities that we introduced in terms of the magnetic moment fraction and number of atoms so as you remember magnetization would be magnetic moment per volume so therefore we can write down that our magnetization of sublattice a big m would be equal to fraction of atoms in sublattice a times number of atoms per unit volume times magnetic moment average magnetic moment of these ions same thing for mb that would be beta and mb okay so we know these two so what we can do is from this we can write the total magnetization of our material ma plus mb now um, you may ask why there is a plus sign there and uh, actually if, when we introduce this magnetic moment here this magnetic moment uh we actually can i highlight no i cannot uh <laughs> um i can highlight using this so when we introduce these two magnetic moments of sublattice A and B, these were average magnetic moment of certain lattice, but these are the moments pointing along uh, the field direction. So, and uh, magnetic moment can be pointing along or against the field direction. So if it points against the field direction, it would be negative. So negative sign is embedded in here. Okay, so we continue this. Total is MA plus MB, and we just write this. Uh, um oh uh, no oh uh, let me say uh, alpha n m a small m plus uh, beta n m b all right so um now as you remember uh this is the magnetization uh and uh, we can use that in a very similar way as we used for uh, ferromagnetism for base theory but for that we will need to have uh, molecular fields so molecular molecular fields this is a base waste molecular fields for uh lattices a and for lattice b uh, okay, so um, so for that we will need H molecular field for sublattice A, and uh, that would be, as you remember, molecular field is equal to minus gamma M 
in general, gamma would be this constant, and it's proportional to magnetization. Now, in this case, molecular field of sublattice A would be equal to minus gamma AB, MB, let me write it down, plus gamma AA, MA. So, uh, what I wrote down there is, uh, this is the molecular field uh, acting on A sublattice. So, molecular field on B sublattice, on B sublattice, is very similar. So, this is minus gamma AB, and these gamma are basically indicating the interactions that we are taking into account. M uh, A, M A, oh, I'm not writing, sorry, uh, M A plus gamma B B M B. Okay, so this is molecular field acting uh, on sublattice B. Now the minus sign here um, basically indicates a contribution to the molecular field, uh, which is opposite uh, in direction to the magnet corresponding magnetization. So um, this is A B lattice B is opposite, so molecular field is opposite. Um, and uh, what we will do then is uh, there, there are two different regimes. As you remember, uh, for ferromagnet, there is this uh, Tc, uh, 1 over chi, as a function of temperature. So there, oops, yeah, uh, there is high temperature part. And uh, let me use different color. There is this low temperature part. Um, so the process is very similar. So uh, what we do, we first, uh, you, you, you already did that, and I already showed that for ferromagnet. So you can go back to the uh, one of those previous lectures and see how it's done. So uh, case number one, high temperature T greater than Tc. Let me circle it and let me highlight it. I think this is the right color. So uh, high temperature. Yes, the correct color-coded temperature areas. So for high temperature, it is basically we define chi as you remember m over h, and uh, it should follow the Curie law, uh, from which we can find magnetization. Magnetization is C H over T. And uh, what we need to do is basically we'll find magnetization using molecular field. And uh, then uh, we will use also our A and B sublattices to find the actual the dependence of susceptibility. So MA, magnetization A. For MA, this, uh, this expression. So we'll be writing this for A and B. Uh, that is C. Now v, H here is a total field, total field. And total field is, uh, consisting of a field applied, applied field externally, and molecular field on sublattice A, divided by temperature. In a very similar way, we write MB, which is CH plus HMB, divided by temperature. Um, so what do we do with these two? We add them. To find total magnetization MA plus MB. So we add these two. Uh, and actually, when we add these two, these, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, so we, we use expression. So you see MA plus MB. So let me highlight, uh, let me underline. So we have MA plus MB would be equal to some of these two. And each of those uh, molecular fields here can be substituted from these two equations. These two, here is this, M and M. So we substitute them in this term and in this term. And once we substitute and equate it with this, we will get us an equation to find uh, magnetization. Oh, sorry, to find the susceptibility, this. Now, um, so what I did is I prepared you 
a written form of these formulas. So um, here it is. I'm just moving it in. It's a PDF file. No, I'm moving it in here. Uh, it's a PDF file. Um, so once you substitute everything into those equations, you'll find uh, expression which looks like this. Uh, it looks like this. And uh, 1 over chi is equal to the first term minus second term. So first term minus second term, and here we introduced chi naught. This is a dip, uh, quantity dependent on all these parameters we introduced before, gamma b, alpha, beta, and etc. And term b, quantity b, which is also dependent on these things, and uh, the c, Curie constant. Now, overall, you can see that uh, there, are, there are two terms here, uh, the first term and the second term. And uh, if uh, we, um, you can pause this here, write it in your notes and analyze what these are. But basically, this equation is obtained from uh, these two equations. So basically, MA plus MB equal to some of these two terms in which a molecular field A and B are substituted from here. So you will get your... Uh, 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 dependence of uh, inverse susceptibility. Uh, let me write it down here. Uh, so uh, that is uh, one, oops, no, let me use like one over chi should be equal to t plus c over chi naught divided by c minus b t minus theta. Okay, so um, there are several things. This one, the first term, inverse, uh, inverse susceptibility is proportional to the temperature. The second term, inverse susceptibility is inversely proportional to the temperature. Now, if we plot these two, uh, let me uh, plot uh, these things. So I would select a line for temperature scale. I will select the same arrowed line for inverse susceptibility scale. Um, okay, so uh, that would be inverse susceptibility. That is the temperature. Now, uh, if you look at this, uh, when uh, it goes, if you equate this to zero, you should be able to find when it is zero. But uh, basically, let me get this back. Um, so what uh, I will do is I will introduce this straight line. This is advantage of using <coughs> digital format. <coughs> and uh, I also will uh, make it a dashed line. And... I don't want to erase the whole line, so dashed line, yes. It's kind of a regular dashed line, but that's that's fine. So it's kind of an asymptotic line. So this value is um, minus C over chi naught. And uh, this is zero. So if you look at, uh, at uh, the susceptibility, it would follow the, basically it would hollow, follow the Curie law at high temperatures. Uh, it should follow it very closely. And uh, then as it goes to low temperatures, it would deviate and go down to zero. This is very, uh, not very smooth, curve. I would better draw it that way. But anyway, this is how the curve would look like. And uh, this, this uh, uh, the uh, susceptibility for Ferry magnets. Uh, now there is uh, um, a couple of things to note. So uh, first of all, uh, there is, uh, uh, it goes down to zero at uh, theta. P, which is a par, it, ha it has a name, let me write it down. It is a paramagnetic, paramagnetic Curie 
point. <clears throat> so it is paramagnetic career point, and this is a point at which uh, the material will uh, get into the ordered state. So again, we are looking at the case of uh, uh, we are not analyzing anything below the career temperature. We are not analyzing low temperature uh, area, but we are rather analyzing this high temperature regime, high temperature uh, area, this, basically this here, this portion. I would remove it, but this was to highlight. Um, so here you can see at high temperatures, if you look high temperatures, uh, then um, as uh, temperature goes up, the second term, this term, as temperature goes high, this term becomes negligibly small in comparison to these. And basically that is what governs at high temperature, this is the main term, and that is why we have linear dependence of or inverse susceptibility on temperature. And this term is negligibly small. So at high temperature, uh, we have uh, basically susceptibility. And if we invert it, then susceptibility would follow the um, Curie Weiss law. So that would be T plus C over chi naught. You can see this is the analog of Curie temperature and Curie constant, etc. So it, this, uh, the, the uh, at high temperatures we have a straight line of inverse susceptibility, inversely proportional to temperature. And then as we approach uh, lower temperatures, this uh, the second term of inverse susceptibility becomes more prominent. This term, and uh, this is what leads this to. Uh, go to zero uh, and uh, uh, reach zero at theta P, permagnetic creep point. Okay, this is high temperatures. Now let's uh, go to low temperatures. So for, uh, let me make the line and uh, let's look at T lower than TC. And again, we will look at the base theory. So T is, we color coded in green. So this is T lower than TC. If I go up in our color coded scale, this is the area uh, below Curie temperature. Okay. So uh, at low temperatures, uh, everything follows, uh, basically what we have is our magnetization would be equal to MA, and we see if we disregard the direction minus MB, so that is the magnetization value, would be equal to the difference of the two sublattices. So what happens is below Curie temperature, or uh, everything becomes ordered. Uh, you have antiferromagnetic order of two sublattices which have different magnetizations. And uh, as I already draw that, one points up, the other one points down, and the resulting magnetization M is their difference. Um, so they are, both of them are magnetized, so you can say that they are following the Berlin, uh, the Berlin curve. Uh, so, uh, as uh, we discussed in ferromagnetism, now I can again try drawing this in a nice and neat way. So, I take these two sublattices, um, I'll draw the axis. What I will do is I will draw a graph of how magnetization depends on the um, magnetic field. So if you look at sublattice A, then magnetization, they have, the, this is the Curie point, and uh, the sublattice A magnetization will look like this. This is MA. And let me choose a blue color for this one. So the, the interesting part about ferromagnetism is that the way how uh, you would 
I get, oh, this is not right. This is not, um, so uh, I will I will fix uh, the scale. <laughs> uh, of course, this is as a function of temperature. So we are cooling things down. Yes, this is temperature. So as we cool uh, the theory magnet above theory temperature, uh, we have a paramagnet, paramagnetic state, which means that the interaction is not strong enough to overcome to to and uh, thermal energy overcomes the interaction between uh, magnetic moments and material becomes ordered. So above thermal energy is high and we have a totally random magnetization. Now the interesting part is that we have this uh, sublattice A and B. Let me draw it again here. So we have B, let's say A small B. Uh, big A, small b. This is b, this is a. So when it starts to get ordered, then the interaction between these two lattices, interaction, uh, the, uh, they both become magnetized at this point at current temperature, but at the same time, sublattice A and sublattice B would behave differently because there is interaction between the two and they would order become ordered in a different way, which means that the shape of this magnetization, as we load down the temperature, how fast it becomes magnetized into which state, uh, it really depends on the material. So it is very typical to have one strong lattice and other one weak, and weak lattice would have a different magnetization curve. So that would be MB. And if you would add these two or look at the difference, you would see that at first, grows very fast here, but then it goes, uh, oops, uh, it's uh, too, uh, let me try to do a better job. So it grows fast and then goes down and to a certain level of magnetization. Uh, so here you see M, uh, MA, magnetization of A lattice grows very fast and MB doesn't contribute much at this point. So we have a fast growth as temperature is uh, decreased. And then as we continue to cool down, then lattice MB becomes more and more ordered and that lowers down the magnetization because we subtract that much. We subtract at every point, we subtract that much from this much. Okay, so this is total magnetization. And as you can see, it really depends on what materials we have and how uh, parts, how these sublattices get magnetized. And uh, there are some very interesting cases. So let me draw uh, this once again. So I take shapes and I draw vertical axis again. This is very handy. And uh, we are taking this horizontal axis and it is the same it is uh, magnetization as a function of temperature and again the same uh, uh, Curie temperature so if I would go down I forgot to put Curie this is TC Curie temperature and same here this is TC Okay, where's my graph here? So, uh, as I said, it really depends on these lattices. So it might happen that you would have a very strong interaction and a uh, so very fast uh, magnetization of sublattice B. So it would look like this, but it is not strong enough and it would saturate fairly fast. Or maybe let me redraw it in a better way. Uh, it would go up and then slowly. At the same time, sublattice A might be magnetizing very, very, very slowly, but to a higher level. So again, this is MA and uh, this is MB. So as a result, you can see B grows very fast. And as a result, when we add the two, you would see a magnetization in the direction of sublattice B, which then would be overcome by magnetization in sublattice A because MA is bigger than MB. So uh, the case for this, there is a very, it's a, uh, it's a special material. Let me write it down for you to enjoy. 0.5 iron 125, chromium 125, oxygen 4. So this is a, oops, uh, this is a very 
uh, complex compound, and you can see that uh, there there are people who um, who do research of these materials because they have quite an inter interesting properties, and they what is typically done is they put different oxides together and uh, make ceramics out of that. So ceramics means that you have powders and you mix powders of different materials, let's say iron oxide, chromium oxide, or lithium oxide, or something else. You mix those together and you heat it up. And when you heat it, uh, it forms ceramics, which means that it's brittle, it can be broken in parts, but at the same time, it forms a magnetic material and you can form these interesting compounds with very interesting properties. So, um, now these were um, ferry magnets, and uh, if you look at the ferry magnets, uh, then you would see that there is A, B, a, up, no, it's not correct. They should be different. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. So there are only two sublattices, and this is ferry magnet. Now there are ferry magnets with more than two sublattices. It's possible to make a ferry magnet, and it's a general name which has three sublattices or more and uh, that is uh, the case where you have for example here you have lithium iron and chromium you see iron and chromium are magnetic and uh, you can make magnetic materials out of those so uh, the imagination can go crazy and there, is, there are research groups who study these materials and they form uh, th there is a certain predictable predictive power if you go in depth you will see there is uh, something that we can expect of these materials uh, now let's look at the examples so what are these materials so examples um, the interesting part is most of ferrites, uh, the, the examples are the ferry magnetic materials are most commonly called ferrites. This is one of the examples, but there, there are different ones. So ferrites, they're a ceramic. They're made uh, out of different oxides, or so typically ferrites is one of the examples. It's... Uh, uh, iron oxides, it can be uh, iron 3O4, and uh, this compound, you probably have heard about this, is called magnetite. It is magnetic, it is magnetic, and uh, more than that, it is a permanent magnet. So this is uh, the one of the first discoveries when uh, people discovered magnets. They didn't find the pure iron magnetized or something they found these oxides which are which can be found uh, in the earth uh, uh, crust so um, this is magnetite and uh, uh, you also can use different other iron oxides there is iron 203 and uh, or 302 actually um, yes and uh, the rest so there are different ones I would I would not say that I'm an expert in uh, in in chemistry, but uh, the, 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 these are different oxides. So typically, these materials are hard and brittle, uh, and uh, they're, as I said, are made by baking powder of different materials together. And out of these materials, uh, you can you can apply them to different things. So as you remember, there are different types of materials. So if we take, uh, no, let me do a better job. So, if you take a look at the hysteresis curve, uh, there is a hysteresis curve that looks like this. So, this type of hysteresis curve uh, suggests that if we magnetize it, so let's say it's demagnetized, broken into domains, we magnetize it initially, somehow, and when we remove magnetic field, it stays magnetized. If you magnetize in the other direction, it stays magnetized. So these are called hard magnets. Basically, they stay magnetized. And it's hard. You have to apply sufficient magnetic field. These are the corrosive fields. 
you have to apply at least that much of a field to get it reversed. Okay, the other type of material is material that would look like this. It would go almost through the zero. There might be a little bit of an opening in the history of this curve, but this opening would be very, very, very small. So which means that these materials are very easy to magnetize one way or another. And these ones are called soft magnets. Oh, let me make it look better. Soft magnets. So there are two different applications. Soft magnets is something that can be easily magnetized in both ways. So, which uh, means that uh, it can be used in electromagnets. So you apply small magnetic field, you magnetize it. When you remove magnetic field, your magnetization goes down to zero. It does not stay magnetized. Or if it stays, the remaining magnetization is very, very small. So these are soft magnets. Hard magnets is something that stays magnetized. So you magnetize it and uh, most of the domains are aligned, pointing in the same direction. So when you're magnetizing it, uh, the align, when you remove the magnetic field, they stay magnetized. So these are hard magnets. You can envision the question and the quiz about that. Okay, so if you take ferry magnets, then you will see that uh, you can engineer a ferry magnet in a way that it can be either soft magnet or hard magnet. And basically by engineering the different compositions of these materials, you would mix sublattices A and B and define how they would uh, interact with each other. So example of uh, soft, let me use this. Oh yeah, actually it's good to have a red one. Soft magnets. Examples would be, let's say, manganese, zinc, uh, ferrum 204, or nickel, zinc, iron 204. So this is manganese zinc ferrite, nickel zinc ferrite. So these are soft magnets which means that you apply field, they magnetize, you remove field, they demagnetize themselves. So they have, they create temperatures are uh, above room temperature. So where can we use those? Uh, let me pull up the picture. So um, first of all, electronics. So this is one of the examples. So uh, you may have seen that before. This is an inductor, and uh, this inductor it has um, um, it has a coil around the core, and this core is a f made of ferrite. It's an uh, ferry magnetic material, and uh, you can bake it. You can bake powders to form ceramics into any shape. So basically, in this case, it's uh, baked into the shape of uh, the cylinder, and you can wind, uh, you can wind uh, the um, uh, coil around it, and use it as an inductor. And uh, uh, the beauty of this is that you can, uh, in, in, in contrast to iron, these materials are very good at high frequencies. So you can use them at, for high frequency electronic applications. So if I scroll down this, I will show you a couple other applications. So inductors can be found in many different shapes. And uh, this is the beauty of using, let me increase the size of it. So this is the beauty of using this ferrite. So you can see there, you can form a toroidal ferrite. It's a ring made inside of this thing. There is a ring made out of the ferrite and wind a coil around that. And uh, you can make different inductors and you can see them in electronics. But besides that, another application is transformers. There are different transformers. 
So there are transformers that are used for converting AC, let's say power supplied, I don't know, 110 volts to 9 volts. But there are also high frequency transformers that uh, transform high frequency signals. So ferrites are used in high frequency transformers. And if you can see this, this is the core of the transformer so it uh, goes around the coil but it also goes inside so inside there is this uh, 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 there is this uh, ferrite the fer ferrite material and it goes outside and inside uh, so magnetic field flux generated by one of these coils it goes out through the uh, core and back in that so and it splits into two parts but it doesn't really matter the important part is that all these coils share the same material we already talked about transformers so these are ferrites now um these are soft ones and they're used in there are many many electronic applications for those besides soft ones you can engineer hard ferrites so oh that's very thin let me increase the font size uh, pen size hard ferrites these are also compounds that are used for different uh, types of applications now if you remember hard ferrites have open hysteresis curve so open hysteresis curve this is magnetization as a function of applied magnetic field uh, you saturate it you go back and you keep it magnetized so uh, naturally you will you are getting a permanent magnet and uh, one of the example is strontium iron 12019 and that's very funny that you have these huge numbers there actually the idea is that if you take strontium oxide and mix it with iron oxide iron 203 uh, in a way that there is one part of strontium oxide per six parts of iron oxide and this is not by weight this is by molecular atomic uh, then this and you bake it together you would form this material strontium ferrite and uh, this material is a permanent magnet you magnetize it and it stays magnetized so where where would you use this well it's commonly used in many many different applications and uh, one of these types of applications is electric motors so you have to have a permanent magnet inside the electric motor to make these coils turn in presence of external magnetic field. Uh, and uh, it also is used in electronic media recording. So you have to record, you might want to have these things. Other application would be... Um, it's less uh it's uh let let me say that these are hard ferrites and uh permanent magnet uh but uh let's go back to soft ferrites soft ferrites and there is something in between as well so something in between which means that you can magnetize it and it stays magnetized but you don't need to spend uh, too much so somewhere in between let me draw this so instead of having this wide hysteresis curve so you have to really um, apply huge magnetic field h as a function of m there are uh, semi-soft or something in between ferrites they still have open hysteresis curve but you don't need to apply too high magnetic field to get them magnetized so the uh, application for these would be recording and uh, there are different materials for recordings for recording so where would you use a recording you can use uh, magnetic material so that's uh, uh, an example of this material would be barium ferrite so barium O times 6 iron 2 O3 so barium ferrite it's a permanent magnet 
it's a permanent magnet and you can use it in permanent magnet applications, but it doesn't require huge magnetic fields to get magnetized, but at least certain magnetic fields. So this material is used in magnetic stripe cards. So your credit card or GSU Panther card has this uh, material in the back. So it's used in recording, recording and credit cards and any magnetic actually it's not only credit but any magnetic card stripes magnetics no magnetic let me make it better uh magnetic stripe cards so uh, again, the interesting part is that you combine different magnetic elements, barium, iron, or whatever your imagination can think of, and uh, you can form a different material with different properties. Now, there is a little bit of a history uh, to these materials, because before hard disk drives were used, there was a there were memory cells that were used in prehistoric computers based on... Uh, of fer fer ferrite um, beads. So I accidentally happened to have one here and I would show it to you in class to look closely, but uh, let me try to show it to you with my camera. So I'm going away and we'll get back with my camera. Okay, so magically I have you looking at the video. So this is my table. So this is a memory cell. So you can see that uh, this is how it's made of. There are two insulating plates on both sides. I already unscrewed two, uh, the three of these screws. So if I open it, you will see this is the memory cell. So let me open it so nothing breaks. Okay, this is a memory cell. So you have, uh, let me see how many. Um, one, it's uh, about 32, 32 by 32. Well, you can count and tell me <laughs> when we'll talk. Uh, you can stop video and count. I won't be doing that. Let's try zoom in as much as this camera allows. Okay, out of focus. Oh, let's ask it to get focused. Oh, that's neat. Good, good, very good. So what you see, what you see here, is this: you see wires. You see these are the wires coming in, and they run through horizontally. There are wires that run vertically, and there are other wires. But in the middle, you can see these dark beads. So these dark beads are beads made of the ferrite. It is a permanent magnet, but you can use these wires. So basically you can uh, use these wires to address each of those ferrites. So uh, you, can, uh, you, you can use it to magnetize them. And uh, you also can use it to read its magnetization because uh, it's, uh, uh, it has certain magnetic moment and it has certain magnetization, so it produces magnetic fields. So let me see if I can zoom in even closer, uh, if this camera allows. Oh, well, that's the best it can do. So let me zoom out and try to... No. No, this is the best. So, okay. So you can see this is, uh, it's very interesting. So this uh, was um, the, the application uh, from probably 50 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. But uh, these ferrites are still used. They're used on the credit cards. They're used on, uh, uh, on many other things. Oh, I, I actually have a uh, zoom in tool here. Yeah, I have zoom in tool. I just need to uh, make it focused. No. 
Sorry, I'm taking your time, but you can scroll. Yes, so you can see through this. You can see these are the beads. They are circular beads with the wire ferrite bits, and each bead can be magnetized clockwise or counterclockwise. And by magnetizing it clockwise or counterclockwise, you would be generating either magnetic field pointing in one direction or the other, and you can detect it using these wires. So you can see there are wires going through it. Okay, so that's the fun part, and uh, um, it is a pity that I cannot let you see it and uh, touch it, but uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, and uh, let me remove the magnification glass and uh, refocus it. And uh, you can imagine that uh, if it's 32 by 32, something around 124 bytes, bits actually, 124 bits stored in that much of space. Um, so this is a pencil for comparison. Okay, I'll get back to you. Let me stop video. All right, we are back on my whiteboard. So barium ferrite and others, they're used for different, uh, different applications. Now, uh, most of these ferrites are, um, most of them are, uh, it, it really depends on how these atoms are aligned. So if I would uh, have um, one magnetic moment here, and the other one here, you can imagine that this is uh, this is a kind of a cubic lattice where they're arranged in a straight line, alternating moments. But in real life, materials are three-dimensional, and you can arrange these uh, atoms in different parts. Let's say if you have cubic lattice, uh, then uh, you have uh, different types of actual cubic lattice. You can place one atom here, alternate atom in the middle. Now, let's say on the face, it's a face-centered cubic. You can put a different atom here, or you can put different atom in the middle, or it's a matter of how you engineer this material and if it would want to grow that way, or if you would engineer it to grow in that way. So, uh, one of those uh, examples of uh, lattices of ferrites uh, is a uh, cubic lattice or uh, uh, they're also sometimes called no uh, they're they're sometimes called spinel cubic uh, cubic spinel now let me write it down spinel yeah you can look it up but uh, in general i have a uh, paper Scientific paper, here it is. Um, no, here it is. I don't want it to be a full screen. So it's published in this journal of physics open access. And uh, the reason why I'm showing this to you is they have pretty good uh, example of this lattice. So I will zoom in here. So this is an example of uh, cubic spinel. And you can see that uh, in their case, uh, it has two different irons, so two different, it's just iron oxide, iron oxide, but there is this red atom and yellow atom, and you can imagine that if there would be different atoms, different materials, they would be have they would have different magnetic moment and even iron surrounded in by oxygen in different forms would have different magnetic moments so that would be a uh, fairy magnet and uh, if we align those in a spinel structure then that you see it's a face centered cubic spinel structure of magnetite and this is magnetite and it, it is magnetic, it's a permanent magnet, but uh, you see it has pretty complex alignment of atoms in it. Okay, so uh, then uh, uh, besides uh, spinels, uh, there are other types of materials that are well known and they're well known for their interesting properties. So other types of materials is garnets. So garnets, uh, you may know different types of garnets. So let's say there is uh, this type of garnet, right? So it's a gemstone. And uh, if you look in uh, Wikipedia or other more credible source, so uh, it might have structure of X3, 
Y2SiO4. Great. So it's a garnet. It has different uh, parts of that. It has elements X, Y, and SiO4 group. It's there is always a oxide involved with that. But this is a it's a gemstone. But uh, what we are we are interested in is a different type of garnet. We are interested in iron garnets. And iron garnets has a general formula of two. Um, metal 2O3 times 5 iron 2O3. So you see the oxides here are the same, but you mix them 2 to 5. Uh, you need a certain a uh, certain structure, you need a certain uh, aspect ratio. Two to five is a special, uh, uh, special case because that would form the crystal lattice that we are interested in. So metal in this case, it can be different, different elements. One of those is yttrium. The other one can be lanthanide series, somewhere from gadolinium to uh, lutetium. So there, there, and this is why yttrium. Uh, let me write it. Yttrium. So the very, very special one is yttrium iron garnet. So uh, yttrium iron garnet is yttrium 203 twice yttrium 203 times 5 iron 203. So I already mentioned that once, yttrium, iron, granite, this is why. Uh, this is a very, very special material. So first of all, uh, you can make a gemstone. Uh, let me show it better. So this is how it looks like. Yttrium iron garnet. It's a crystal. You can make a very, very nice crystal out of it, and you can make a fairly huge crystal out of it. So the beauty of it is that it forms a soft ferromagnetic material. So it's soft ferromagnetic, uh, ferry. But we can say it behaves as a ferromagnet. It has ferromagnetic behavior. Uh, so if you draw the M versus H curve, you will see something like this. And it would be very, very narrow. So it would you magnetize it and it goes back to where it started from. But if you make it fairly thin, one of the advantages is that it becomes transparent. So if you would like to have a, magnet, a transparent magnet, thin layer of, and by thin, I mean that several microns thick, let's say three microns thick yttrium iron garnet is still transparent. Uh, of course, it doesn't look transparent here because it's a huge bulk crystal. Uh, so it's transparent, so it can be used in optics where you need magnetic field. And other thing is that it has very, very, uh, the magnetic moments can oscillate precess around magnetic field in this crystal for a very, very long time. So they do not relax. There is no relaxation of the oscillations. This is one of the few, one of the next lectures when we will talk about magnetization dynamics in magnetic materials, and we will get back to this material. But because it has low losses at high frequencies. People can do this. So this is an example. Uh, you can see two transmission lines here. So there is one and the other one. And they form sort of a loop around this red sphere. And this red sphere is yttrium iron and iron garnet in the middle. So if you look at this, basically you have half coil. So imagine that you have material, you have one coil on the material and the other coil on the material. So this is the same, except that we don't have many turns. We have only half turn of one electrode and half turn of the other electrode. But uh, when you apply uh, AC voltage, AC 
to this electrode. It would transform this voltage through the sphere, but you have to make magnetic moments inside this material. So you have magnetic moment. You have to make it. Now uh, you have to make it precess. So uh, let me draw it. Here is your magnetic moment. Here is this H, and you have to make it precess. It turns out that uh, magnetic moments can oscillate around the magnetic field, but they have a very very precise oscillation frequency. And what you can do is you can apply magnetic field to this. Let me see. So if it's uh, okay, I'll draw a random magnetic field here. We will talk about that in one of the next lectures. If you apply magnetic field to that, then magnetic field would define oscillation frequency. And that's Larmor precession frequency. We talked about that already. So what it means is that magnetic moments inside the egg would want to oscillate only at the certain frequencies, and only at these frequencies, this transformer will transform the signal. And it actually doesn't transform, it transfers signal from this line into that line. So it would transfer it only at the certain frequencies at which magnetic moments of that sphere will oscillate. So what happens is that if you look at the transmission, and transmission would be, um, this is out and this is signal in. Let me change it to in. Transmission, which is signal to V out to V in. Ratio of output to input language. This is transmission. And if you look at it as a function of frequency, then you will see that uh, there is a transmission at low frequency. And at certain point, it drops out, it drops down to zero. So it turns out that the system cannot oscillate faster than certain frequencies, and that's defined by Yig. But in real time, in uh, in real life, it's even not that. It turns out that there is a certain resonance of this sphere, and it won't, it wouldn't want to oscillate at these high frequencies. So it won't go up, but it would rather be very low, and then at resonant frequency it would go up, and then it would die almost to zero. So what it means is that this forms a filter. And the beauty of that filter is as you increase the magnetic field, this frequency shifts. Frequencies at which this crystal oscillates are all in gigahertz range. So which means that this is a microwave filter. And it's not just the filter, but it's tunable filter. You can tune the uh, range in which it transmits. And there are commercial microwave tunable filters which look like this so it's a box with uh, two connectors so you may notice the connectors these connectors these are microwave connectors so-called sma connectors they're good up to 18 gigahertz and these are typically used in uh, microwave equipment including for example the cell trans cell, cell phone transmission so this is sma but there are other miniature connectors and you can see that inside there is this permanent magnet or electro actually it's electromagnet there is a coil and the center of the magnet which produces the magnetic field pointing into the chip and there are there are um there is a this uh, yttrium iron garnet in there and microwave parts with these coils around it one coil around it other coil underneath and etc and some other uh, parts of the microwave circuit so by changing and you can see that these wires of the coil go out to these two connectors so if you apply if you apply a battery to these two connectors you would energize this coil and this coil would produce magnetic field magnetic field would change the magnetization of this yig sphere and it would affect the frequency at which the signal is transmitted again this is jumping ahead a little bit but we are talking about applications of fairy magnets all right at this point i'll uh, stop the lecture and uh, i will meet with you during our regular webex sessions and uh, uh, make sure to do the quiz after the lecture all right goodbye